For all of you who listen to Submersion and own an Android device, go to the Google Play Store and download the Podcast Republic app. It's a fantastic app that allows you to get all of your favorite podcasts directly on your Android device. I personally use the app and I love it. I can search for the podcast I want to listen to, select it as a favorite, and have it just a click away. Make sure to select Submersion as a favorite so you don't miss any of our new episodes. Again, the app is the Podcast Republic app, available on Android devices. Episode 86! Woo! There we go. Does it sound excited? Are we excited? Yeah. Mm. And I I do have to apologize to listeners. I got a little bit of cold that might come through. I might blow my nose. I might make some gross sounds. And you just have to deal with it. People right. love that. They do? That's what they like with podcasts? People, when you people relate to make that. Like, I also heard they like like mouth noises, like and if you have any crackers to eat, if you want to eat some crackers. Perfect. But anyways, this is a very exciting episode. Um, not only is Kyle not around so we can plot the eventual uh, mutiny that we will be doing to take over his captainship, uh, but it's also the last movie oh, in the Jamie movie heavens. month. Wow. Right? It's it felt like much more than a month because it has been. And I just keep on churning out the hits. It's all the movies that everyone wants and loves and knows about for sure. 100% these are movies that people have heard about. And yeah, this is the last one before we move on to a, a very, very special cycle that I think we're all yeah. very excited has anyone, for. Has anyone spoiled at all what, what the next cycle is? I think is? so because we had, we had asked – didn't we had ask at one point for Zach to have – had a uh, had a Godzilla screech. Oh yeah, ready for yeah, when we Kyle were gonna talk me about under it. The bus there. Yep. Yeah. Did well, I did I just throw you under a bus again? Do you have the screech ready? I do not have the screech ready. No I, screech ready. Okay. Well, People well, have tell to wait. Us, though, Zach, do we know what uh, what the first episode uh, of Go Go Godzilla Month will be? Do you know? We I do know, but I'm not gonna spoil it. Oh. No, no spoil for that one. Come on. No spoil. The focus the focus is right now on the last of the best month, which is the JV movie <laughs> month. And uh, with me and all of us today, who's here? Uh, Brom. Yeah, we go. No, you got to do your catchphrase. That's me. Oh, that's a good one. I like the, I like the other one better, though. Wasa, wasa, wasa. There we go. That's a good one. Bitconnect. Uh, it, okay. <laughs> and then who else is here? I guess we've already been saying your name. Uh, Zach. Nice. He likes to party. I, I, I do like to party. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. What's, what's been up with you guys? You have a good holiday? We did. We even uh, teamed up in person and uh, played some cards and hit the bars. Yeah, it was a nice oh, little Friday you, night. I was going to say, is it the Friday, Friday Thanksgiving? Yep. It was. Typically, Wednesday night's the, the night yeah, to go say, out. Yeah, Wednesday, Wednesday's a good one. Friday's a good one, too, though. But uh, Wednesday's off, often also t- the, the big day of travel for people. I think mm-hmm. that was the case probably for Zach. Nope. All right, Thursday. <laughs> yep, Thursday morning I was commuting. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, nice. I, it's kind of rough. I mean, you get off work and you got to drive three or four hours in Zach's case. That's that's too much. So I understand where you're coming from. But uh, I didn't go out Wednesday this year. Got off work, was too tired, but linked up with Zach on Friday and had a good holiday and uh, spent some time with the family. I Got uh, the pigskin out and played some football with the nieces nice. and nephews. Uh, it was all-time quarterback, and let me tell you, I was the Aaron Rodgers of uh, of the backyard football this Thanksgiving. I was uh, hitting my nephews in stride. You were the Tom. I would say the Tom Brady of. The backyard, but maybe not, not uh, as applicable I'm gonna nowadays. Go with, I'm going to go with the greatest of all time and say Aaron Rodgers. Uh, there we go. What about the Lamar Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> Looking pretty good. We got to keep he things playing topical. In, uh, no, was it last night? Tonight? Uh, well, Yeah, tonight's Russell Wilson. Maybe you're like Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson and Kirk Cousins. Oh, yeah. You're just like Kirk Cousins out there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. My holiday was I was supposed to have family come in to the great tundra, but we actually had a snowstorm. And they had to cancel their plans. So it's just me and Danzig living it up in the house. Oh. And we, uh, I cooked a giant turkey expecting that there would be guests. And we still have, we still have turkey left over. She made two different casseroles with the turkey and we still have turkey left over. That's amazing. I know. It's just all, it was like a shitload of turkey. And I kept <laughs> on cutting the turkey and there was more turkey inside of it. It was almost like the turkey was inside of the turkey. Maybe you got a pregnant turkey. 
Could have been. Somewhere Could have along been. the way, baby you, you got a cold. I know. Yeah. Then, then through from probably from cooking up a storm because I cook. I cook Thanksgiving dinner basically virtually on my own. Just like all the dishes, my responsibility. I take care of business. I actually do it not just once a year. I do it two or maybe three times a year. I cook a full Thanksgiving dinner, and um, I love doing it. But yeah, it seems like the stress of that responsibility and then all of the eating that comes afterwards and the drinking and the merriment has gotten me a little bit of a cold. I rarely get sick, but I'm a little sick right now. And well, I don't like it. Yeah, what can you do? We can jump into this podcast. All right, let's do it. If only there all was right. a sound effect. Oh! Dive, 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 dive. Whoa. What started as a group of friends, something, something, blah, blah, blah. No, Kyle, Kyle will take care of that. What began as an innocent conversation among friends would soon spiral out of control and later be referred to by future generations as the eighth wonder of the modern world. Mac East Studios takes you on the journey of your lifetime as your captains, Alex the Mustard Man, the artist formerly known as Brahm, Jamie the Ointment, Kyle El Capitan, and Zach the Backbone present Submersion. So Zach, what did, what did we watch this week? Oh, we watched the classic film that everybody and their mother has seen, Fool Fathom 5 from 1990. Fool Fathom 5. Now, Alliteration! Yeah. <laughs> Quick uh, pop quiz, hot shots. Uh, who had ever even heard of this movie? Not me. No one. Pretty not, much me and uh, <laughs> yeah. We had, it always comes when you search like submarine movies, it comes up. But it's really weird because you think, oh, it must be like a big movie. But then it's got like very, very, very few number of votes on IMDb. And me and Kyle were looking. We were out at some uh, event at one, one night, and we were looking. Oh, where can we find this movie? And the only place you could find it was VHS. And that night, we had had a few drinks, and we were like, "Should we buy this VHS tape?" And we were like, "Yes!" And we bought the VHS tape. And then Kyle had to like get a VHS player so he could <laughs> and, burn it. So that's what we were watching. <laughs> was the burn? Yeah, it was oh, off of the VHS tape that we got, rough. which is why why you may have noticed the quality was less than stellar. In the end. <laughs> Just a pinch. <laughs> Here's, yeah. a here's a question for you that you, yeah. you started to raise there. Thinking back on it, guys, off the top of your head of the movies we have watched, what percentage of them would you say you had heard of prior to the podcast? So out of 85 um, movies? Or yeah, I would probably say like pieces? less than 25% of them, maybe oh, even less. Yeah, I would say Easy. it's probably, I don't even know. When we started, it'd be like 10. Mine would probably be on one hand. <laughs> Yeah, we're probably like started ten ish. We're really dredging the bottom of the seabed this series. And we've been we've been dredging the bottom of the seabed for like the last year. Yeah, honestly, like since episode forty, basically <laughs> getting um, pretty rough. We're getting close yeah. to season two, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, but this one, yeah. So this was one where, yeah, we almost had to buy a VHS player just to be able to watch it. Um, I didn't necessarily know that it was going to be as low quality as it was. Uh, it's pretty crazy, but did you recognize any of the actors in it? No. <laughs> no. So the, the main guy is kind of a weirdo, and we'll talk a bit about that. But immediately I recognize him. He's one of the main characters in the movie Troll. Oh, and he the original plays Harry Troll. Potter. Yeah. So okay. the the kid in that is Harry, named Harry Potter. And <laughs> really? the dad's Harry Potter Sr. And this is Harry Potter. And in that movie, he's really strange. And there was a story about him. And apparently he was like, you know, as many actors are, struggled with alcohol and stuff like that. So I think some of this is just like he was a well-regarded Canadian actor, but he also, you know, was – had had his own stuff going on. And one of the things in that was he kept on going to the director and being like, so what's up with – what is his motivation? What is Harry Potter Sr.'s motivation in this? And the director kind of just kept on being like, well, you don't know. He's like, he's oblivious. Like, well, why wouldn't I know my son is being like – tricked by a troll I don't, i'm not confused i'm confused by this motivation and he's like oh no because he's silly he's a silly character he's a silly character and he goes oh so he's silly and then he proceeded to wear a silly hat the rest of the movie and so in the movie he wears like this weird like fisherman hat and apparently it was because he's like oh because he's an idiot i get it and that's how he was like getting into character and so oh. i recognize the medium like holy shit that guy and then he's like super weird in this one too yeah, like really very, weird. very awkward 
Yeah, very odd, very odd uh, mm-hmm. character for this one, considering he's the main character. I'm just going to chalk it up to the bad writing. It could be. But it's yeah, based I, on a bestseller. I know, and written, and the screenplay was written by the guy who wrote it, the book. Hmm. Yeah, this is a, it's based on a book, Full Fathom 5, that was the first in a series. I'm just going to blame and it on the poor guy directing. Some. The director went on to do a bunch <laughs> of major motion pictures. I'm just going to blame it on but bad producing. <laughs> oh, well, that could be, because it was produced by Roger Corman. There we but, go. Who knows yeah. that guy? Famous producer. Um, all right, sure. Should we get into it? I don't know. Yep. Do you have a good, you guys want to say anything else more about this particular film before we jump into the actual recap? Nope. I nope. got nothing. Okay. So we open and we're like, whoa, I thought this was about a submarine. Why are we on land? And why is there like a crazy distraction being put on by Panamanian rebels in Panama City 10 days? Or was it, was it 20 days? 10 days. 11 before days. The, sorry, 11 days before the invasion of Panama by the United States. And I was like, wait, that's a real thing. So is this movie actually has this documentary? And mm-hmm. it was. And so they have a big explosion and clearly it's a distraction. The military and the police, they go out and they're like, what the fuck was that explosion? At the same time, the, the, the head Central of the rebels Bank. yeah, are being are, – is, has been captured and he's in the police station or military base or whatever. And he's getting tortured. And they're basically like, you got to tell us when this invasion is happening, bro, or we're going to keep torturing you or maybe we'll even kill you. And the guy's like, I can't tell you that because I'm a rebel. And they're like, okay, well, we're going to bring in this doctor and now he's going to drug you and you're going to tell us the truth. And so just as the rebels, after setting up this distraction, bust into the police station and get go to get him, they've just uncovered this information. They found out that, in fact, the U.S. will be invading Panama on the December 20th and – and then the the rebel sister jumps in, kills the doctor, and rescues her brother. But so now the the government knows all about the invasion, but the rebels have also gotten away, and they they head off, and they, they I don't even know how they got into communication. They've got the U.S. government has decided that they are going to save them, and so a submarine, the Aspen, USS Aspen, surfaces off the coast of Panama, and the rebels go out and uh, get onto the submarine. Um, and our, we are introduced to our main character, Captain McKenzie, a.k.a. Mac. And he's like a superhero. He's like big and hunky. He's like real sexy and hunky. And he like uh, immediately is like super heroic when the, the lady, uh, what was her name? Justine. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Justine, she falls out of the boat and, before getting onto the submarine. And he dives into these like the storm – into the choppy waters and saves her and gets back on the boat and he's all like hurt from doing this and basically is told to like, you know, rest up and go back to his bunk. And he goes back and who's there? Uh oh Justine looking naked. Pretty hot, pretty hot stuff. Naked. In his bunk. In his bunk, all curled up, warming herself. And he's like, whoa. And he gets like big bonker eyes and like a, a wolf's tongue like rolls out of his mouth. And then he has to roll it back up. And he's immediately like a smitten kitten. He's like super into this lady. And it's like, uh, I love you, even though you are literally the head of a, a rebel faction in Panama. He's like, he's always asking her like, but why are you, baby, maybe you shouldn't be a rebel. And she's like, uh, it's literally my life. I'm a rebel <laughs> in Panama. And he's like, yeah, but what happens if you like didn't though? Like, well, how about that? How about you be with me? And it's just very strange that mm-hmm. immediately he's like super into someone's a rebel. Like, uh, Brom, have you ever fallen in love with someone who is devoted to some kind of rebellion against a major government? Uh, just about every week. Oh, okay. Well, so maybe I, maybe I'm misinterpreting it. Maybe it's me. But anyways, it seems very strange. He's a, he's also like he like meets up with her later uh, the next day. He's like he's basically bunked up with uh, her brother, the actual the the head of the uh, rebel faction, and immediately like, hey, you want want to see like the submarine? And the rebel leader's like, uh, no thanks. But Justine's like, yeah, I guess I'd like to take a look. And he's like, come with me, and starts giving her a tour. And even then, when the XO comes up and is like, uh, sorry, you need to like check on something because it's actually pretty important. He like lingers and like watches her leave and is like, oh yeah, well, I wish I could only, if only I could give a tour to Justine all day long. 
I guess I have to be a captain of a submarine. And so he goes over and they basically discovered the Russians have a trench going from Cuba all the way to Panama that they can use without uh, being detected at all. So it's a huge like security risk and they, they probably need to let everyone know. And so the captain's pretty excited about this. He says, good job to the XO. And this is, so that becomes like the main thing that they're like going to be focused on uh, when they go to, um, when they get back to the base in, Pan in Panama City. All right, flash over to the government of Panama. And they are none too happy having learned that Panama is going to get invaded by the US, a major world power uh, in about 10 days. Mm -hmm. And they're like, is this just like a CIA thing? And everyone's like, we don't know. And they're like, there's only one thing left to do. We, only, we have literally only one option. Brom, what's that one option? I have no idea. Uh, Zach, what's that one option? <laughs> um, you got to do it when you have the time to do it. I do remember the scene, a bunch of guys sitting around the, the big boardroom table. Oh, yeah. And they're basically like, there's only one option, uh, nuclear blackmail. Oh, and I was like, is yes. that a thing? I didn't even know that was an option. And basically they're saying like, <clears throat> the U.S. is a major world power. We can't negotiate with them. We can't stop them from invading us. What can we do? Well, we, we, have, well, we have to become a world power. And how do you do that? You get nuclear weapons. And how do you do that? You hijack a nuclear submarine. Duh. And so yeah. that's the that's the plan that they they start to put into action, which is ludicrous. It's an actual it's like a crazy person's plan. <laughs> what could go wrong? Oh, we'll see exactly what could go wrong uh, when they actually put the plan into action. Has this has taken this, a, goes awry. Uh, a a turn from from the true story of uh, what was happening in Panama at this time, Jamie? I do believe that this was not something that occurred in okay. real life. Although, who knows? Government may have kept it quiet, like the JFK assassination, because no one knows that that happened too. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So anyways, they are like, okay, we better get some people, some submariners. Where are we going to find those guys? And they go over and they find a bunch of ex Cuban exiles who were just kind of like chilling in Panama. And they're like, Yo, you want to make a, make, you want to make a big, a quick buck and also be part of like the military again. And they're, they're all disillusioned. The main guy's like clearly a crazy person. He's like, no, thanks whatever and when they but they when they explain the plan you get to command a submarine immediately they're like on board which may be a, like a bad sign when it's like don't you want to have like a life and be good and they're like no and they're like but you get to control a submarine with nuclear weapons and they're like oh yeah actually now that you mentioned the nuclear weapons that i directly have control of i do actually want to be part of this plan and so they they all are uh, grouped together, they're gonna. He's gonna collect all of his other Cuban exiles that he knows about and create a crew, and it's gonna be them plus this Panamanian general uh, who are gonna control a submarine. And they go out and they set up a little bit of a ruse, a trap for a submarine, where they they have a Russian tanker that's supposedly on fire and it sets out a distress signal. And the Russian submarines like, we're not gonna fall for that bullshit, whatever. Let's go silently over there, but we're not. We're just going to check things out. And they go over and they check it out, and everything looks like it's on the up and up. There's some, eh, it's weird. There's some like uh, fishermen over to the side. <coughs> Seems to be strange. They're like dro some people dropping. Like there's all kinds of kooky stuff happening with their radar and their sonar, and they're like, eh, whatever. Everything looks still pretty good. So they surface and they head over, and immediately some nets are thrown onto their propellers. And they're held at gunpoint and they're basically like, you have no choice. We're taking your submarine and they're thrown in jail and the submarine is taken. And so bad job by the Russian government at that point or Russian Navy because they, their submarine is taken pretty much immediately. And so at this point, we kind of have two things going on um, because they're gearing up right now. Panama is gearing up for stuff on the U S side. Uh, Mackenzie is recovering. So they send his XO out to check out the trench and kind of like they're going to lay low and time everything and know when people uh, go from point A to point B uh, at any given time. And Mac's going to recover because he's got his leg injury from diving into the ocean. He takes this opportunity to be like a crazy stalker person and he invites Justine out to dinner. And you're like, oh, that's fine. What's wrong with that? That seems like a perfectly fine date. Well, then he 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 is like super weirdo. He's always 
really close to her, like really, really close to her, always like st stepping in front of her, which is a little strange, playing music a lot. He sings a lot, which actually comes to uh, a benefit later on that he, so he sings all the time. Um, he dances a whole bunch. At one point, they're just walking along. He just like starts dancing with her. And he kind of goes in for a smooch at one point near the end of the night. And he's always super soft spoken. He's always like, "Hey, how's it going?" But he's not—he's he's soft spoken with everyone, like every single person in any situation. He's like, "Hey, how's it going?" And oh, I really like this song. Maybe we should do a little of that song. Oh, beep, beep, boop, and let's do that song. And we're singing that song. And we're singing, singing, and singing that song. And so he's doing this, and he's just like prattling on and on and on. And she basically is like, "I'm uncomfortable with this," and runs away. <laughs> That's yeah. the end of the date. <laughs> yeah, I was a little more surprised that she was kind of interested in him than he was in her. I know, right? Well, because yeah. he's, he's got that, I mean, he's got those washboard abs and he's such a hunk, right? <laughs> <laughs> guy, you have to do, your, do yourself a favor, listeners, and check out a picture of the guy because he basically looks like, well, he looks like a dad, basically. And she's right? truly beautiful. She is a gorgeous actress. Yeah, she's a beautiful lady and he looks like he should be playing like a suburban dad, uh, cutting some hedges and getting angry at the neighbor's dog or something. It's like that's that's basically he's accurate. bald. He's bald. He is tall, so he's got that going for him. But he like prattles on and on, just like nonstop talking in this very low monotone um, at all at all times. He's very creepy. Anyways, uh, that didn't seem to go super well. But he is not perturbed by this. He's everything seemed to him. It went great. <laughs> so he's he's super into it. Um, and. We also see uh, the Russians. We do get like a, a one of the Russians is able to escape the prison and get onto the submarine as like a cook pretending to be a cook. This is a little confusing because I'm not sure why it wasn't a bigger deal on the base, right? Because there's like a there's like a prison break, and one of the prisoners is lost, but they they don't seem to check the uh, submarine to make sure that the guy's not like not on it, it's like pretending to be someone else. Whatever. It's a it's a minor part, except it's kind of like a major part of the actual Yeah, that is plot. true. Um, we get some scenes of, of kind of showing just how crazy the Cuban uh, exiles are once they're on the submarine. Because the, the Panamanian general, who is supposed to be, or presumably is the bad guy from the start. Like in the beginning, you're like, oh, this guy. What a dick, right? He's got kind of a smug face. And you're like, get out of here, guy. Uh, he, you think he's the bad guy, but he's actually the one barely holding on control of the submarine because all the Cuban exiles are super jazzed about just like blowing shit up. So they see like a freighter and they're like, let's blow up that freighter. Like, oh, give them a warning. They got to like evacuate their freighter. And he's like, get off your freighter. And then he's like, and now that we blow it up. And the Panamanian guy's like, whoa, no, no, no. We have to, they have to, ex they have to evacuate. And so they watch them evacuate. And once they're evacuated, they blow it up. And he, you can tell the Panamanian guy's like, that was weird. Like you almost didn't wait for them to get off that boat. And then just almost immediately afterwards, they see another boat and they don't even stop. They're like, ah, fuck it. And they just like blow up the boat. And he's like, oh, we just committed like mass murder. And the uh, Cubans are like, eh, whatever. And so he tries to stop them and is thrown in the brig. So he's out of the picture. And so now the Cubans, they get their own idea of what, what's going on. They're like, look, they just gave us the opportunity to be world powers. We have nuclear weapons at our disposal. So, uh, yeah, they have an idea of what they want. They don't want the U.S. to invade. Guess what? I want something else. I want billions of dollars. And how do we get billions of dollars? We steal the technology from the Los Angeles-class submarines to sell to the highest bidder. Duh. And so they demand from the U.S. plans for the L.A., all of the nuclear launch technology and most advanced weaponry. They need to give, it, give, that, give all that up to the Cubans. We're also going to blow up. Uh, Houston, which makes sense given where they are in the world. Kind of a funny city to target, I guess. Yeah, but very probably random. the biggest, the biggest in the area? Question mark. I mean, they kind of mentioned Miami, but they kind of like waved that off as saying, "No, I have family in Miami. Let's blow up Houston <laughs> instead." And it's like, okay, that's good. Houston is a big city, so that works. Um, and so they are obviously the U.S. is. Not super pleased about this uh, the development here. Uh, they need to take these mofos out of town, and so they call Mac and they're like, "Okay, the only submarine in the area, and they've they've done a pretty good job of blowing up everything in the area. The only submarine we could possibly even get in there is the Aspen because it's already there and it's been running silent in that location for the last like 
but a couple days. So they don't even know it's there. It's already there. It's perfect. But it's crewed by your XO and the rest of the crew is like super inexperienced because they were just going to be a monitoring mission. So we, you need to get on there and you know lead them to victory. And Max like, uh, yeah, I can get on there with a DSRV and being submarine heads like we are, we all know what that is. Deep sea rescue vehicle or whatever. Uh, deep submersible rescue vehicle, something like that. And he's going to take that guy and get onto the submarine. And we're like, cool. But first, what does he got to do, Brom? He's got to get his Latina poontang. I would I would put it maybe a little more delicately than that. Uh, he was going to have a, a fine evening with his lady friend, uh, Justine, uh, who comes by and literally it's like she can't resist him. She literally cannot resist the hunger yeah, no. man. That I, is need to, I need to start taking some notes from this guy. Yeah, start shaving your head and get that nice uh, <laughs> receding hairline. <laughs> like receding hairline. Mumble, mumble oh, a whole bunch. Man. Then, then always like stand really close. Like just always get right in front of the person and get really close to them. And then eventually they'll reach out and take your hand. And then you'll have a very brief, odd uh, lovemaking scene <laughs> that's still included in a movie. <laughs> yeah, invade their personal space and yeah. awkwardly sing music to them. Yep, and then have a receding hairline. So if you're not yeah. losing your hair yet. Get on it. I, I am not, but uh, eh, I could try. Right. And so uh, it's pretty steamy, and I was pretty into it. I put my glasses on, um, but I didn't get to see anything. Because nope. obviously this is more or less like a PG movie. Um, so anyways, they, he gets on the DSRV. Uh, he's going along, and it, they basically – they're like, oh, we got 12 hours. This will be really easy. Well, not so easy when there's an immediate sea quake that drops a bunch of rocks on top of them. At this point, I didn't. I actually thought maybe Kyle had messed up the recording of the movie. He's like, how do they even finish this movie in time? They're trapped under a bunch of rocks, and there's like 17 minutes left in the movie. It's, for, it's, it's crazy how quickly everything goes from here. But they sit there, and, and one of the guys in there who is – it's the weirdest thing is just how many people in this are like kind of famous – the guy who's in the submersible with him, I think, is like a major film director. <laughs> like who, the director of Little Children and stuff. Uh, Fields, I think. I mean, that was that's the guy's name. But I know he was like – there was a, an actor in this movie who, was, who directed like Little Children and In the Bedroom and a bunch of like critically acclaimed films in the 2000s. And I'm pretty sure that was him. And I was like, this is so strange because they were kind of mumbling back and forth at each other. Uh, for a bunch of this. But he had like weird quotes at this point. He was like, uh, what can you do with that arm? It's like the submersible arm. Mm. And how good are you with that arm? He's like, I'm the best. I was like, what a weird quote to have. <laughs> and uh, they, he kind of like shows that he's the best with the arm by being able to move some rocks off of it. Uh, but because they got slowed down so much time, they weren't, they kind of, uh, they were going to run out of air and it's going to be really tight actually getting to the submarine at that point. Was this so uh, mini to, miniature work, by the way? Because it, it, it actually I, wasn't the worst sort of effects that I'd seen yet to this point. I, it wasn't that bad. I, the only thing I can't say is whether it may not have been reused. Okay. That's the only thing. I don't know. Because yeah, it, it actually looked pretty good for the movie the thus only, far. Yeah. The thing that I would say is that Corman, Roger Corman films, I think generally th the miniature work and stuff like that is like a big part of it. Um, the sets and stuff are less so, uh, and I think the sets themselves weren't as um, interesting to look at as maybe you normally would right. see in a submarine movie. But yeah, the miniature work, Corman does a lot of that stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if if that was original and not reused. But I just couldn't tell because it's weird that they had like a DSRV scene in it and that they were going through like a tunnel and had like a sea quake and it just felt, it felt a little bit like it would have been from a different movie. Yeah. But it's hard to say. Uh, so anyways, they, they are kind of going along and they're searching for the submarine, but the submarine is ordered to be quiet <coughs> or run silent. And so like they're not going to um, – they're not going to signal at all uh, to the submersible, even though they can, they can hear them and see them. And so eventually though, what comes to save them, Brom? Uh, I don't remember. It's the singing. It's the singing. It came back. <laughs> basically yeah. they run out of air and everyone falls asleep and or the other guy falls asleep and max there and he's singing his little song that he sang to his love of, love of his life and they're like in the submarine they're like I, I, i'm hearing some singing and he's like 
I mean, I, just, I didn't know he sang, but that I feel like that's that might be Mac. And so he tells him to flash some lights and kind of take the risk. That they're not going to make noise, but they're going to they're going to flash some lights. And Mac's able to see them and get on board. And his singing, his awkward weirdness, saved them in the end. Yeah, very long scene. Extremely long scene, especially considering it was basically at the end of the movie too. So we're left with only like a few minutes left uh, to actually resolve what's going to go on. This whole time, the Russian guy who got onto the submarine as a cook, pretending to be a cook, he puts his plan into action. He frees the Panamanian general. They run out. They like poison <laughs> the uh, weapons guy and start uh, messing with the the missiles so they can't launch them. They then get have to do battle with a bunch of different people, and there's just wrenches everywhere. Wrenches are flying everywhere. People, one person getting wrenched over here, another person getting wrenched over here. These people all are killed too. Like we see them one second, they're like, "Oh, these are going to be the heroes who kind of save things on the submarine." They're just pounded to death with these wrenches, and they're like, "Okay, we could still launch the missiles." And I was like, "What a what a crazy storyline here." Didn't even delay anything, really. Uh, they got it back and running just in time to launch the missiles regardless. They just, all it was was getting their head pounded in by wrenches for the uh, pleasure of the viewers, I guess. And so um, at the same time, the U.S. submarine kind of pops out and shoots a torpedo at them. They're able to evade barely on the Cuban side or the uh, the, the Soviet submarine is able to. I didn't know what happened at this point. There seemed to be some kind of ricochet that also damaged the U.S. submarine. It was hard to tell what that was. Mm -hmm. Mac, like, Mac was like, wait, there was an echo? And then he gets all like, he's like, dive! And apparently there was some kind of like ricochet from the uh, torpedo that they also get damaged. And then they do a little trickery on the against the Cubans. They launch off their DSRV. And so they, they think they shoot off a torpedo and they think they destroyed the uh, U.S. submarine, but they just destroyed the DSRV. So as they're doing a very, very slow countdown to launching the nuclear missile to destroy Houston, at the same time, the U.S. submarine is lining up their torpedo. They shoot off the torpedo, shocked that they're going to die. They try to quickly launch the missile, and just before he presses the button, the submarine explodes. And so the U.S. wins. Mac wins. Uh, he also gets back, and his lady loves heading back to the front lines as a rebel. And goes up and he's like, why don't you stay a few more days? And by days, I mean years. And by years, I mean our lifetime together. Will you marry me? <laughs> and she's like, no. And he's like, well, that's too bad. <laughs> and then he walks off and freeze frames. <laughs> and that's the end of the movie. That freeze yep. frame was legit too. And she, as she drives away, she goes, I'll miss your Captain Dick. And that was that. There it was. The there it is. Yep. There's the Captain Dick. Well, what? What? What are you talking about? I didn't say, I mean, I'm just saying what happened in the movie. And the freeze frame happens and you just hear that said. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of it. And it's a very, very strange movie. Some odd yeah. stuff. It's one of those where it's hard to, it's just so hard to, I don't know, say what you think about it. It's a oh, difficult one for shot? me. Uh, well, I can I can give it a shot. I will say that I, I it was obviously nice to get into a new sort of theater of war. Uh, That's right, yeah. Panamanian we, invasion. Yeah, we weren't um, you know doing our typical World War II or Cold War uh, set films here. We were in a completely different neck of the woods. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see some different characters from a different uh, diff different neighborhood. Um, but ultimately, I, I think I'm going to be probably in line with what everyone else is going to say about this. That it, like a 10? Uh, <laughs> this was not a 10 for me. Uh, the production quality was just so bad. There were, there were, it was, it was strange. There were scenes, there was like explosions and some of the miniature work was impressive. Uh, some of the scenes uh, on the sub were, were serviceable. Uh, but everything just felt so, I, I, I just can't put my finger on it. I, I just, I don't know if it was the writing or the act, uh, the acting obviously was not great. Uh, it was very stiff and wooden, um, like that Captain Dick. Um, right. um, and ultimately it was just a really clumsy film and it, it just ne never really felt like it had a rhythm to it. And I think, 
what did we give last? I think I gave last week's a one or a two. I think this is in the same ballpark for me. I'm going to give this a two as well. Nice. Okay. Zach, Zach, what about you? Um, well, should we do the um, love it or suck it segment? or? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> sure. All right. Like, uh, uh, put in the music here, Kyle. All right. <laughs> Full I don't think we have thought. a song yet for it. Do I don't think we have a song for that one. <laughs> maybe we, that, maybe we, that, we, that did was we make it. one last time? That, that yeah, might be. <laughs> <laughs> be kind of bad if it is, but <laughs> let's go with it. So full fathom five. Now the love it or suck it segment, or maybe it was love it or hate it. I can't remember, but I'm calling it love it or suck it because I think that's funnier. <laughs> this is when I pick a ten out of ten review and a one out of ten review, and we discuss Ooh. and share what our thoughts are on their reviews before we give our reviews. Except Ben already gave his review. Now. Well, maybe he'll change his mind, though. Maybe, maybe he'll maybe realize that it's really good. Maybe he will. So I, I'll, I'll go in with saying yeah. that IMDb has this rated as a 3.7. Yes. Now, here is a 1 out of 10 full-on suck it review. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Oh, I'm ready. All right. It has been a long time since I saw this film, but many details are burned in my brain due to the magnitude of their suckness. I will say, though, <laughs> if you want a bad for entertainment purposes movie, Laser Mission, Laser, is even better. I picked it up because I had heard the title was good, but they must have been talking about the book. I watched it with my dad, and neither of us wanted to turn it off since, surely, they, the whole thing, can't be this bad. We were wrong. It was. I distinctly recall the flame bursts with every gunshot were more like a lighter held sideways oh, yeah. than a muzzle burst. Mm. The acting was, well, just There's plain There's a lot of bad. smoke coming out of those guns. A lot <laughs> of smoke. These people wanted to act, and darn if they weren't going to take advantage of their chance. I think that there were a total of two shots of a submarine. Oh, the side that's an shot exaggeration. As it passed by underwater and the breaching shot, the later possibly ripped from an early copy of Red October. Each was used a minimum of five times. Much else I can't remember. Other than I watched it for about five minutes thinking it had to get better. The rest mm. of the time impressed that it actually got worse. Huh. I'm sure some of you are wondering how long it would take for this new segment to have a review without a 10 out of 10 to compare to. Well, we only had to wait until week two. Right. There is no 10 out of 10 review for this film. That was the only wow. review there was a one out of 10. Boom. Yeah, I was gonna actually gonna say because there's only like a hundred votes on IMDb, <laughs> so I'd be surprised that there was anyone who would bother to write a ten out of ten the, review. The only people that bothered bothered to actually write a review was one out of ten. <laughs> right. There Let it is. Just, I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly check Amazon. Love it or suck it. And fans. see if that had anything. But I'm guessing no. It also did. Yeah. That did not oh. uh, inspire me to change my review. I uh, again, I just I don't think there there wasn't like that lucky coin. There wasn't our that's true. There wasn't our iconic villain. There was really nothing that that I'll remember about this movie. Uh, even though our our friend there that gave a one star review seems to <laughs> have some things emblazoned on his brain. This is just going to be one of those I forget. Oh. Other than maybe the uh, <laughs> the uh, I gotta again I gotta take some notes on uh, how to pick up these lovely. Uh, Lovely ladies with uh, the strategies employed by Harry Potter Senior. I do. There, there is for the Full Fathom Five VHS on Amazon. There is a five out of five review on Amazon. Is there? Yeah. Should I read it? Please do. We have to hear the love it to counter the suck it. By the way, yeah. I want to shout out Big Mike from the from October twenty second, twenty sixth, two thousand and nine. Thanks, Big Mike, mm -hmm. for that great review. So this one's from October fourth, two thousand twelve. Irishman 55. I was extremely satisfied with the quality of the product VHS video sealed in factory condition upon opening and playing it was satisfactory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that guy likes VHS tapes. So. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, you know what, guys? Rom, I'm, I'm gonna have to give it. A, I'm, gonna have to go, I'm gonna have to bump it up to a six. <laughs> yeah, that might change your review then. <laughs> oh, did not have that experience. Did not physically have the film. Although I do like the box art; it is pretty cool. It's a hand painted uh, submarine true, yeah. wrecking into each other. Didn't happen in the film. Kind of a <laughs> false advertising, really. Yes. Uh, so wait, Zach, did you give a review? Oh no. <laughs> okay. Um. I mean, what's there to say about this film? Not a lot, right? I mean, mm. the suck it guy summed it up. It, it, not good. I don't like it. I'll never watch this again. I, I, I'm i just going to be... What did you give it, Ben? Two and a half? I gave it a two. I'm, I'm going worse. One. Very nice. Um, at some point, I think Kyle's going to interject his review in here, probably. Okay. So we're going to hear him. He'll probably be like, oh, hey, I'm Kyle. Well, I really like this film a five and a half. By now, I'm sure you all know that I have to cast my review as an absentee. I was not able to make it onto this episode while everyone else was recording, but I did watch this movie, and I was not going to just have watched this and not say anything about it. I mean, come on. I'm sure the guys have covered a lot in the movie so far, but my word, plot of this thing was all over the place. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. We had the rebels who took off and they went with the U S I mean, that makes sense. The U S was backing these rebels. Then Russia came into play, but the Panamanians kidnapped a Russian sub. They instead of like working with Russia and then they freed a guy from prison, a wild card basically to run the sub and he lived up to his name. I mean, he was he was just blowing stuff up for no reason. He thought, oh, we just got to flex a little muscle. That guy was a little wild. I, and then they were all shocked when he took over and ultimately held the world hostage with nuclear missiles. Seemed pretty crazy. And some of the things that were going on in the movie, I didn't really enjoy. There were a lot of times where maybe it was because... Maybe on television that make for a good commercial break, but then when you're watching the movie, just normally it doesn't make a lot of sense. As soon as Justine went and freed her brother, next thing we knew they were on a beach, and then also in a scene that could have been could have been much better when our captain was on his way to the submarine after being on land for so long in the submersible. And they're captured by the rocks. They're running out of air. Like, you got to lay everything on the line. They see the sub all of a sudden and just dock with it. I mean, no problem. I mean, those guys had literally no air. I would have liked to see stressful situations, I guess. But they just kind of glossed over it. Also, this may be one of the worst love stories that we've probably seen Again, Captain saw Justine. He's like, okay, look, you got to go on a date with me because I saved your life. And she's reluctant, but eventually just says, okay, whatever. They go. They start dating for a little bit. Things get hot and heavy. Then he gets sent back out. And then all of a sudden, when he gets back after saving the whole world, she's just like, yeah, this, this isn't going to work. And he doesn't really even seem to care. I don't know. Weird love story. Weird movie. We did have a few things that I really enjoyed. And one of them being that if you are a submarine captain and the lady is on the line and you shoot your shot, 99 times out of 100, you are going to at least get a date, right? I mean, come on. Uh, some of the things that we look for in these movies that I did notice I did appreciate uh, we had a wrench used quite a bit, first used to, uh, you know, knock somebody out and then to literally beat a guy to death who didn't even put up a fight and seemed kind of weird. We also had some decent torpedo action. We were in the sub for quite a bit. We had a mini sub, you know, a DSRV, so not necessarily like a mini sub perfectly, but I mean, is what it is. We'll take what we can get. And ultimately, all these things just kind of fell short, I think. I don't know I don't know why 
uh, just some of the stuff wasn't done better because we did have, like I said, wrench, mini sub, a lot of torpedo action, fire in the sub. Come on, we've got it all. We've got everything. But plot was just a little crazy and acting not good. Visual quality. I'm sure Jamie has already mentioned this, or at least some of the other guys have. This is a movie that I was able to find on VHS. And <laughs> I don't think this movie ever made the jump to digital. So watching it in that way, you know, you're not going to get the best of the best. But what can you do? Uh, I went through based on my new scale with the weighted averages. Uh, and we'll just go through this. Plot gave it a three, sub action four, acting two, music sound two, visual quality two, enjoyable three, fire in the sub, wrench, which I doubled up on points for the wrench because we had such a great like double wrench scene. And we had a mini sub and fish in the water. They never said it, but we had a lot of torpedo action. All in all, with all these things, the weighted average, which I have to give this movie, is a 3.08. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it back on over to the other guys. Wow, Kyle, that was that was really insightful. Um, mm. I think that's just way too high, though. Yeah, I agree, Kyle. It's way too high. Uh, and then I'm, you know, I gotta say, I'm in line with you guys. This movie is terrible. It is funny. Like it's it's funny if you are really into things that are super weird. Like I think sometimes <laughs> for bad movies, people like to have something that's really in your face bad, like a really bad accent or like a really bad um, choice of casting or like Soul Man where someone's in blackface, but it's a 1980s movie. And you're like, what were you even thinking? I'm confused. Like they want something that's really like out there and in your face. Mm -hmm. This is pretty subdued in its weirdness. Like Michael Moriarty, Mike, Michael Moriarty. God, I can't even say that. Michael Moriarty. Oh my God. I can't say it. It's like a Michael tech, Moriarty. There we go. You said it. Uh, he's just a really weird actor. It's the second time I've seen him, and he's as bizarre in each of the films. So you could, I could definitely point to him and say that's something that that is interesting. Um, it's not like a total zero, like um, Stinger or something right. like that. Uh, is it a one? Is it a complete worthless piece of shit? Yes. No, <laughs> I don't think so. I'm gonna give it a. I'm gonna. I'm gonna bump up because of my boy Mike. Captain Mac with his ripped abs and his his just like lady skills of the ladies skills of the Z. I'm gonna bump that up to one and a half. Give right. him a little half star. Okay. I, th I thought the story was competent enough. I guess it, it is a little confusing. Like I'm not sure why it was necessarily like they were like we're gonna wait for the submarine to come through the trench one more time. Like I think they kind of shoehorned in a lot of different aspects of submarine other submarine movies to create a plot. So it's like, oh, we're going to hijack this thing. So we're going to set up this booby trap. We're getting on the submarine. There's this trench, which is very uh, Hunt for Red October. Well, see, I, was, I wanted to bring that up. Trench. Do we think that this was one of those films that they kind of rushed quick because oh, it, this is the same yeah. year that Hunt for Red October Yeah, October yeah. This is, this is 100%. Roger Corman was well known for – he was like the mockbuster before – uh, the asylum type thing. Like he, okay. he was always putting out things that were similar to other ones, uh, mostly sci-fi and uh, that kind of stuff. But like knockoff Terminator, that kind of stuff. Like that was his wheelhouse. Okay. So yeah, I think 100% this was supposed to be kind of uh, an alternative, a lower budget alternative to Hunt for Red October. So they have a trench, they have a Russian submarine mm -hmm. kind of going through it and all that kind of stuff. Where do you think that deep right. deep uh, sea rescue submersible came out of then? Because um, they really, it know. seemed like they, they gave so much time on screen to that that they probably thought that was going to be a big selling point for the movie, but it kind of just felt out of place to me. That's interesting too, because I wouldn't necessarily, like, I would say, oh, it's based on a book, so it must have been in the book, but... I don't necessarily think of like Roger Corman as being someone who's like, oh, we got to be really true to this book. Like it'd be just as likely in my mind that they had a miniature of a DSRV lying around uh -huh. when they were like, yeah, we should use true. this. Could so be. I don't know. I, I don't know what the, whether the plot involved that already or that was just a convenience thing. 
Okay. All right. Ready Ready for some uh, trivia? Let's yes. hit it. So there wasn't a huge amount of trivia on this guy, but there are some interesting tidbits. Um, <clears throat> it's based on the best-selling novel by Bart Davis, as we mentioned. It was the first of several books featuring Captain Peter McKenzie. So if you do want to get more information, Brom, about his lady skills, maybe they'd shine through in those books. All right. In the end, um, something to look out for. Uh, most of what's written about this film actually regards the director, Carl Franklin. He gained fame for directing a number of large films in the 1990s, so like Devil in a Blue Dress and Out of Time, which are both Denzel Washington films, High Crimes, uh, which is like a Morgan Freeman film. And so almost immediately following the cutting his teeth on this and a couple other smaller Corman films, he started to write and direct much larger Hollywood pictures. Uh, and this was one of the last, I think it's either the second to last or third to last thing he ever acted in. And he, from, since now, since then, he's been a, a, uh, exclusively a director. Um, he directed a bunch of House of Cards and won, like, or was nominated for an Emmy and that kind of stuff. And so now he does, like, a lot of TV. Um, but it's funny, like, he, he does have, there was a book um, about Roger Corman, and he, would, he talked a little bit, uh, this guy talked a little bit about Full Fathom Five. And he said, he said, I think with the films with Cameron Scorsese that they worked on with Roger Corman, they were better than the ones we were doing because they were actually going to theaters instead of straight to video. I mean, the submarine set we had on Full Fathom 5 was made out of Cadillac parts and cardboard. A heater was used as an intercom. They wouldn't stand up in a theater with an American audience, but man, just to come out of film school and to have someone put some money behind you and let you go out and expose the film and shoot. Nobody does that anymore. I went out and shot three features in a year and a half, and it really gave me a lot of confidence. We shot Full Fathom 5 in Peru. And then it kind of like goes off on, a, on talking about how crazy it was to film in Peru and the Philippines uh, with these different like uh, producers and, and cinematographers and stuff like that. So, I mean, he basically, it was like the, how he got into film was working on this film in particular. Uh, it did get reviewed by some places. Like some, a lot of the films that we have never got, re never get reviewed by like mm -hmm. Leonard Maltin for his books and stuff like that. This one did, I guess maybe because it was a Roger Corman thing. So they consider it big enough. It just doesn't seem like it is big enough to have gotten in there. Uh, but it got a bomb designation in Leonard Maltin's book. It was said it was far too cheap for its ambitions, which I'm not sure what the ambitions were because it didn't seem like it had any ambitions other than to just be a film. Uh, it was filmed in Peru, which I, which was mentioned. It's interesting because I don't, you don't really think of that as a filming uh, location, but for Roger Corman, it was. Um, he, that in the Philippines were his two, two of his major uh, uh, filming locations. Uh, and his connection there was uh, Luis Losa, and it was co-producer with Corman on the film, which is interesting because I recognized the name. I was like, Luis Losa, that's weird. Why do I recognize that name? Well, he started, he ended up being a pretty major director in Hollywood. And so that gets me to casting what ifs. What other stars of Luis Losa films, Yosa films, uh, would have done well here? How about Eric Estrada from Hour of the Assassin? Do you guys know who Eric Estrada is? Yes. From Chips? He's like Chips guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The bike guy? The bike guy, yeah. Uh, Eric Estrada. Well, can we recast Michael Moriarty or do we need a nerd? For the Michael Moriarty character, I'm looking ahead on my things. I think there's a couple candidates for Michael Moriarty. We don't. If we're going to do a nerd, Eric Estrada might be the best well, candidate. Eric if you Estrada want to keep is, it within he, the, is he a Latin American? He could have been one he of is. the. He could. He could have been one of the uh, uh, Panamanians. I think he should. He should either be the crazy. I mean, he should be one of the major characters. So either the Cuban, kind of like a crazy person, or the the semi hero uh, at the end who tries to do right. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Be I, up to him. I get, I'll give him the option. Okay. He can choose. What about Tom Berenger from Sniper, another <laughs> Luis Llosa film? Uh, he'd be one of our. Do we have any like captains or admirals in this one? Yeah, we do. We have the guy who was sending them out on the missions and stuff. Okay. There we That's go. That's what you're thinking? Yeah. What about uh, Sandra Bullock from Ooh. Fire on the Amazons? Ooh. Hmm. Um, We'd probably get called out for whitewashing if we put yeah, her in as can't. Justine. We can't. So we have to make a new uh, character. That's going to be the wife of one of the crew members who ends up getting crushed by a torpedo. Ooh. And she's like real like worried about his safety. Or like the – or or wait. Why don't we just – she can, she can be the – she can be the, the driver of the DSRV and everyone's like, a woman? Yeah. I like that. I like that. 
You know? And she's like, ah, I'm the best. Uh, what about Sly Stallone from The Specialist? Sly. Sly's got to be our, I, are you, is that Mac or no? You think that's not, not good enough? I mean, it could be Mac. I, I, again, I don't, are we looking for like a nerd to be the Michael Moriarty character? Yeah. So I guess we, we, we pass on Sly. We say no thanks. <laughs> it seems like a travesty. I think we just got to go with it. What about uh, J-Lo from Anaconda? That's where I recognize the name. I was like, wait, why do I know that name? Oh, he directed <laughs> Anaconda. Well, right. uh, J-Lo could be Justine, right? Mmm. Right. I didn't even think about that. She's just like a woman of the world. I didn't I didn't even make the connection. She's just She's Puerto goddess. Rican, maybe? I believe. Well, I don't know. But if she could do it. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. There Justine. J Lo. And then finally Ed Harris. Now that could be Mac, right? Put on little glasses, a little tape on I them. I actually like that a lot. Yeah, he'd be like a sexy nerd. Uh so he was in Amazons of the Amazon. And it was a story of an adventurer, and he has like a trusty whip at his side and like a fedora, and he's like, hey, what's up? And he's always swinging in and out of adventures, right? And he's real cool, and he needs to get like an ancient artifact. Um, but the Amazon women of the Amazon, uh, they're real sexy, and they want to get the ar artifact of their own. And that artifact, guess what it is? Uh, his sweet bod. Uh, the Holy Grail. No, it's sweet bod. Oh. Yeah. It's his at rock hard apps. That's the, they want to get that artifact. They want to grab it and touch it and really feel up on it. Um and so the real question is, can he get the ancient artifact um, before they get his sweet bot? Oh, I, I'm going to guess they probably don't. You don't think they get his sweet bot? Then why am I watching this movie? I think he, I think he slips away from him with the grease and he gets oh, to the artifact in time. I see. So it's kind of like a tease. Yeah. You get that grease on those abs, but then he uses it to slip away. So as a viewer, I'm like, put the grease on the abs, but then I'm like, oh, the, it tricked me because the grease is how we got away from it. All right. Ah. All right. <laughs> Mr. Then, uh, <laughs> then a quick phantom zone. Engage the phantom. Phantom's engaged, sir. Uh, this one's pretty easy. Michael Kavanaugh was Garvin. So he was like the admiral guy who was kind of like saying like, go here and do this. Um, and he appeared in already in two that we've already seen, Grey Lady Down and Crash Dive. So we can use those to go go to Phantom. No big deal. He was also listed as being another submarine film called Escape Under Pressure, starring Rob Lowe. And the listeners out there and maybe the co-hosts on here, if you go to IMDb and look at the poster, it is pretty hilarious. Rob Lowe looks like He's like super hungover whenever they took the picture for Escape Under Pressure. But uh, the description is Elgin Bates, a billionaire art collector, hires a British sociopath to help him find a priceless, long lost, storied sculpture. Bates's man unearths the sculpture in Greece, but it's taken from him by Athens Customs and put on a tourist ship bound for a museum on Lesbos. And Root, Bates' hire, Bates's hired guns, hijack the ship, start a firefight with the soldier's garden statue, and prepare to rendezvous with a sub in Bates's hire. On the ship are a scholar and her daredevil husband. She recognizes the statue and grabs it for the sociopath can. With the ship sinking, she and her husband are under figurative and literal pressure to find a way to escape with their lives and the statue. <gasps> That's pretty good, right? Mm. Yeah. Not too shabby. And that's what I got. Um, the only other thing I, I had is if we wanted to do a little... There was like a little like subs worldwide I could have done since like Kyle's not here. Okay. Are you going to do it? And just like, j just a quick <clears throat> like highlighting of yeah, it. Do is, it. You say, you say I'm doing it. Do it. Do it. Can I, do it. can I cut in? Yeah. Yeah, you can cut in. So I looked up this like submarine Panama just to see if there's like a Panamanian submarine. First thing that came up was a thing called Submarine Explorer, and it was a submersible built between 1863 and 1866 by Julius H. Kroll in New York. And they built it for the Pacific Pearl Company. J and they Jamie, can I cut in? Was it? Yeah. Where is this? Where is this at? Where's what? The, but uh, Sub Worldwide, you, you mentioned a country or something. What was it? 
Panama. Well, so they, they, they built it in Brooklyn, but then they were going to use it in Panama to find pearls. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> was, there, was, there a, was there a plane flying there? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Only got 20 seconds of this. All right, I'll just cut it because apparently this YouTube video had like an intro to it with an airplane <laughs> flying. Sorry, I didn't expect that. Panama. Well, that's what. Oh, there we go. That's, yes. <laughs> Panama. Right, go on. <laughs> okay. So anyway, submarine explorer, they built it and uh, brought it down to uh, Panama. They they did a bunch of like di- Wait, where dives is this at? <laughs> <laughs> Panama. <laughs> Uh, and so they did a bunch of dives with it and tried to find stuff. They, but it really didn't work. They had already overfished like the area. And so there wasn't really much there. Not only that, but like the guy died Ooh. while diving. So like he got the bends. They said he died of fever and they were like, ah, he died of like, uh, you know, like a sickness, he had a fever. And then the second time got they took fever. it down to dive, the entire crew got a fever and died. And so either the submarine was filled with like a sickness or they kept on getting the bends because it wasn't built properly and died from the sickness that, that resulted from it or whatever. Like, yeah, like they even, they looked at it afterwards and they were like, yeah, this wouldn't work. <laughs> like, their prof- their dive profile was like way off and the submarine wasn't well made. And so like they would have all probably died. And so then they never got to use it. It's just abandoned. You can see, you can still see the hull. There's a picture of it at the Pearl Islands. It just is sitting there. It's all rusted out from the 1800s. Uh, Pearl Islands, and you can go see it. All just right. sitting there. Wow. So if we want to go, I mean, if people want to donate, just like Venmo me some cash, we could do a trip <laughs> down there, and we'll do a live podcast. Yeah, if we ever, if we ever get famous enough, I think we'll do like a like a like a six part or eight part series, and we'll go around the world and visit all these submarines we've talked about. And we can take the one listeners. special fan. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Let's, let's, start Patrick, a, let's start a Patreon or a Kickstarter, and the one special fan can donate basically like $20 million, and we can fund the whole series with that, yeah. with that one fan. You can bunk with us. Yeah. Nice. All right. I got some, uh, I got I some news. That's all I got. We want to do some quick oh, some news? news? Yeah, do it. News? You, say you got news? some news? I got news. I got news. News? News? No, I, 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 I ain't you, got news. You thought I was looking up news? <laughs> all right. This is... From defensenews.com, this was published four hours ago by David oh, hot. David B. Larder. This is hot, hot, hot news. It's been shared 761 times on Facebook. Do you guys want to know what it is? Yeah, I do. Okay. So the U.S. Navy on Monday, that's today, awarded its largest ever ship building contract to General Dynamics Electric Boat for construction of, guess how many Virginia class attack submarines? Guess. How many? Eight. Jamie? Twelve. Ooh, you boys. Nine. Oh, Eight. you're better. Eight of which will have 84-foot section that boosts the boat's strike missile capacity. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Now, you crazy little boys out there, guess how much this is worth? Oh, gosh. I don't remember how much uh, we've been <laughs> saying these. Like, uh, $1.3 billion each. So there's nine. So, so you're saying like $10 billion. $10.5 billion. Jamie? I think it's more. I'm going to go $20 billion. So the contract for Block V Virginia's for these nine submarines is worth $22.2 billion. Wow. I knew it. How knew fun. It. I got one. Jamie got one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there you go. It's uh, the first one is currently under construction. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll just stay tuned to the podcast and we'll update you on this. That's it. Great. Next episode, <laughs> they'll be starting on the second one. Awesome. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> countdown time. Tube three, ready to fire, sir. Commence the countdown. Give 
it to me. All right, guys. So it's been a little while. Uh, we've been really struggling to get through Jamie Movie Month, mainly because Sorry. they're they're bad movies, and we're not really excited to get together every week to talk about them. No, I'm just kidding. It's been been the holiday season, and we've been busy. But uh, I know you guys have been missing out on my countdowns, and I know how much you guys appreciate this uh, these little bits of. Uh, <clears throat> culture that I bring to your life. So I have a very important countdown tonight. Uh, we watched the film uh, was a was <laughs> full fathom deep, full fathom five, full, full fathom, fathom five. five. There we go. <laughs> Which, as we know, <clears throat> for all you English buffs out there, is an alliteration, meaning that uh, it's it, it's re repetitive in the sounds that is that it's made there. Meaning, namely, it starts with the letter F for each letter of the title. So you're probably thinking, well, of course, that's got to be the best letter F alliteration in film history, right? I've well, got no, one. Well, no. Let me – yeah, I know you got one. <laughs> uh, let me enlighten you a little bit about the top five films with letter F alliteration in their movie title. And these are what, by – specifically their letter F? The letter F. Whoa. Okay. And these are Rotten Tomato scores. <clears throat> ben, are these uh, all real movies know. or are these movies within movies? These are real movies with letter F alliteration. I think there were like 12 of them. Wow. And that doesn't include things like Fast and the Furious because... I was going to say, there's going to be a lot of them would be Fast Five. Fast Five does count because it is letter oh. F for both uh, words of the title. Uh, the word the is allowed, but that seems to be the only thing that qualifies as uh, alliteration here. Every other word needs to be starting with the letter F. So number five... <gasps> is Fast Five. Nice. There we go. The 2011 film that doesn't need any introduction here. It scored a 77 on Rotten Tomatoes. Number four, you guys probably don't know about. Well, maybe Jamie does, but it is called Funny Face and starred yeah, Audrey yeah. Hepburn and Fred Astaire. Uh, from okay. what I understand, Fred Astaire did an impromptu fashion shoot at a bookstore where he discovered a new talent in the form of Audrey Hepburn. Scored an, Wait, that, is that the plot of the movie? That is the plot of the movie. Nice. Scored an 87 on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. Number three, Freaky Friday. Oh, oh good one. I didn't even think about that one. The 2003 one with Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan, oh, where they I've swap bodies. Scored an 88 on Rotten Tomatoes. It's not that good. I would agree. Number two... F for fake. It is a documentary by Orson Welles and is all about fraud and fakery. Hmm. So these are, you're doing all the best ones? These are the best. We're, we're ticking up. Because uh, I was going to say, there's some, there's some like bad ones out there. Oh, right? there's, some, there's some stinkers. We're counting up. Uh, but this was number two, uh, 1973 documentary. Scored an 89 on Rotten Tomatoes. And number one... On Rotten Tomatoes here, it scored a 100%, probably because what? there's maybe only like two reviews or three reviews or something like that. But it is <laughs> The Four Feathers, a 1939 film. Get this, boys. Stars a friend of the show, Ralph Richardson of Silver Fleet fame. Oh. And if I understand this correctly, people talked differently back in the 30s here. But I think it's about a British army officer uh, that's kind of like flaking out and, and is going to – he's being drafted into war basically in Egypt. And he draft dodges or evades, I think, something to that effect. And uh, calling they call him a coward. His girlfriend and three of his officer friends give him a white feather. So he ends up getting four white feathers. And as an act of redemption, he ends up actually going over uh, to serve in the war uh, when the when the war takes a turn and the British are falling behind, and he ends up uh, saving his friends' lives on the battlefield. They remade that movie. Yeah, it looked like there was a couple uh, iterations of it, but yeah, and, uh, yeah this, this, like this, this the, version. The well known one was the Heath Ledger one. Oh, really? Yeah. So Heath Ledger played the main character of a two thousand. 2000. Yeah, 2002, Four Feathers. Oh, very so I'm, interesting. I'm thinking of a movie in a movie that starts with the letter F and there's three words to it. Do you guys know what I'm thinking of? Ooh, movie in a movie. Three. It's famous. So from 
Is it Tropic Thunder? Good try, no. Uh, what about, was it maybe in uh, Super Bad where they rattle off all the porn films? <laughs> it's not super bad. Um, let right, me, what is it? You want me to give you a hint? Want me to milk this out? Or you want me to just tell you? Yeah, one, one hint. <laughs> one, one, one hint? hint. Yeah. All right, a character in the movie, um, uh, they say a joke. It's a TV show that she's talking about in the movie. And she, on the TV show, which is the name I'm looking for, is um, it's about a mama tomato, a daddy tomato, and a baby. This tomato. this is a mistake. Just tell us the answer. <laughs> and the mama, dad, and the mama tomato and the daddy tomato are walking down the street, and the baby tomato is walking too slow. So the uh, daddy tomato turns around and smacks him and says, "Catch up." That's the uh, joke she said on the show. That actress that said that was Uma Thurman. <laughs> that movie was Pulp Fiction. Uh, okay. Now the show movie that she was referring to that she was an actress on was Fox Force Five. Boom. Oh, oh. Fox Force Five. Right. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for blowing up my uh, countdown there. It's a real Zach fact right there. <laughs> I knew that right that, off the top of my head. <laughs> that was the top five films with letter F alliteration in their movie title. Yay. All right, bring us home, Zach. Let's get on with it with the Zach Vax. Oh, wow. <laughs> Destroy the child. Do, 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 Zach Vax, it's Zach Vax. When you're going down, get some Zach Vax. When you're going down. Zach Vax. <laughs> <laughs> Infowars. Despite what viewers like you might think, the entire film was fully shot in North Dakota. Zach fact. Interesting. <laughs> Despite what viewers like you might think, the relationship between Peter and Justine was fully fictional. Oh, because yeah, because the sparks were flying off the page. Yeah, a real dirty dancing like romance going on in that one. <sighs> yeah. Despite what viewers like you might think, the submarines in the film were fully over 18 fathoms. <laughs> Wait, they were 18 fathoms long? Zach fact. That's what the fact yeah. is. Okay, well, I can't argue with the Zach fact. Despite what viewers... That's a very long submarine. Despite what... You know. despite <laughs> Here we go. <sighs> despite what viewers like you might think. There are not five full Zach facts this week. Boom. That's it. Uh, Wait, I think uh, I misinterpreted something. I said fathom. Wait, you said fathoms? What was I thinking of? I was thinking of a league. Yeah. League is a very long, but a fathom is very short. I was using words from the title of the movie, guys. Full. Fathoms. Oh. Fathoms. fathoms very short. Five. I did want to. There was one thing I forgot to mention about that uh, that subs worldwide thing. By the way, they re they re exhumed like pretty recently. They they re exhumed the guy who built that submarine. They they unburied his body to prove that he died from a sickness related to Ben's. And there was a guy, a maritime archaeologist, and that's his title, maritime archaeologist, Sweet. James Delgado. He said, I have no words to express the sentiment of emotion. It's a lot of emotion, also some sadness. He said as he held part of the remains in his hands. Just seemed very odd <laughs> as he held like the crumbling remains of a person. Yeah, yeah. that that seems like a a job they didn't really have to do. Why would they no, need to and do specifically, that? I'm not sure why the maritime archaeologist was necessarily handling the body yeah. himself. Because he's a maritime specifically. He's not and an it, archaeologist. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. huh. That's not a Zach fact. Hmm. It's not a Zach fact. It's a real fact. It's a real fact. I'm reading it off you of the You guys just want to make hmm sounds until uh, Kyle cuts us off? Yeah, probably. Hmm. 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 Hmm.
Thank you for listening to Submersion. Be sure to subscribe for new episodes every Thursday. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating wherever you listen. Want to interact with us? Follow Mac East Studios on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.